for Grand Rounds Forum. Uh, we're really honored today to have Dr. Suzaki uh, join us from uh, St. Joseph's in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And we're really honored to have Dr. Aurora Pryor, past, past president of SAGES, uh, join us now and current president of the Fellowship Council join us now. So, um, you know, Rory, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, we've been trying to gain some uh, momentum around the advanced GI fellowships. And you know well from the Fellowship Council side that there's a lot of uh, sort of diversity within this group. So we've been trying to use this forum as an educational forum, but also to get some uh, community among these fellowship types. So I appreciate you joining us for this and uh, for um, in, in an, it, it actually being the expert discussant in an area that is super up your alley. So we'd love to bring out the nuances and please do think about postgraduate level discussions rather than, um, you know, sort of routine stuff. Most of the fellows should be well versed in, in, in this disease process. So like to get to the next level outside of straight, you know, what do you do to repair these things? Okay. Hand over to you, Dr. Pryor. Well, sounds perfect, Rohan, and thanks for having me. It's actually really great to see you guys doing this, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Dr. Sasaki and I have been talking a bit about what she's going to present, and I think it'll be a really good um, presentation. So, uh, Tina, kick it off. All right, thank you. Um, so today I will, oh, I'm Tina Sasaki. I am the current fellow at St. Joseph's. Um, I am an old fellow, as I like to tell people. Um, I was actually working as trauma acute care surgeon for eight years before starting fellowship. Um, and so I find that, you know, I, I, I'm seeing things a little bit differently than maybe the traditional fellow does. Um, so today I'm going to kind of go over hiatal hernias. Um, my specific case uh, is a giant parasophageal hernia uh, with intermittent volvulus. Um, Dr. Cho is our program director. Dr. Reifenberry is our assistant program director. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time over the historical perspective and sort of the evolution of where we've gotten to where we are today. Um, it's pretty interesting. and I. In all honesty, I think it kind of, you know, gave me a better appreciation to, you know, where we are today. Um, briefly going over hiatal hernias, parasophageal hernias, um, and uh, discussing surgical approaches that are available or interventional approaches, I guess. And then presenting our case, and we will discuss mesh a little bit and then go into our conclusion. So a bit of historical perspective in the 1850s, um, the hiatal hernia was first reported um, by um, Henry Ingersoll Bowditch. He reviewed all reports of diaphragmatic hernias um, over a 200, uh, 200 year period. And he found three cases, um, which he described as a dilatation of the esophageal opening that was very curious. Um, and noted that the esophagus, esophagus had a very abru abrupt change of its course and all it ascended through the diaphragm as usual, but turned back toward the left to enter the abnormal aperture caused by the hernia to join the stomach and the chest. So um, this is the first report of a hiatal hernia. Diaphragmatic hernias were well documented prior to this time. So a couple of years later, um, Dr. Rokitansky, who was actually a pathologist, um, noted that there was lower esophagitis and he attributed this as secondary to esophageal reflux. Um, jumping forward about 50 years, Eppinger actually diagnosed um, hiatal hernia in a live patient by using auscultation and x-ray imaging at the same time. Prior to Eppinger um, in the late 1800s, radiographic studies were used using bis uh, bismuth capsules, mercury-filled bougies, mercury-filled balloons, um, prior to autopsy of, patient, um, of deceased patients. Um, in 1919, Angelo Soressi, he was the first to publish a description of an elective repair of um, hiatal hernia. Um, and he has, it was titled diaphragmatic hernia. It's unsuspected fre frequency, um, it's diagnosis technique for radical cure. And he described it where, you know, you had to suture, the suture has to close in the most perfect manner, the opening that the organs pass through it without compromising the organs. And so we get into 1925 where we had uh, Julius Friedenwald and Marie Spelman um, who associated the symptoms of, um, uh, of uh, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of some things here. Um, 
associated symptoms of hiatal hernia and identify the causes of a hiatal hernia. Um, in 1926, um, Ockerlund proposed the hiatus hernia and classifications. Um, he classified them as one, those who had a congenitally short esophagus, so an intrathoracic stomach, two, paraesophageal hernias, and C, none of the above. <laughs> Um, he also noticed that these patients um, had postprandial pain, heartburn, and dysphagia. In 1926, Robbins and uh, Jankelson uh, showed that there was radiographic evidence that reflux was associated with um, epigastric external discomfort in 90% of their patients with hiatal hernia. Um, a couple of years later, Harrington published his experience treating 27 patients. Um, he further refined the criteria for patient selection. Um, and um, define, or decide, or declared that, you know, if you have an incidental finding of a hiatal hernia, you should just observe it. Up until that point, any finding of a hiatal hernia was surgically repaired um, and felt that repair is only necessary if the patient is symptomatic. Um, and um, if he was unable to close that hiatus adequately, then he would suture the herniated viscera to the abdominal wall. So in 1930, uh, Ritvo um, had 60 cases from 8,000 barium studies that he had performed personally. Um, and he determined that uh, the symptoms um, associated with hiatal hernia uh, in a majority of patients were mild, uh, and oper operative measures were only rarely necessary. He also was the first to document um, that the cause, well, I won't say that the cause, but that he believed that the cause of hiatal hernias was due to increased abdominal um, tension, uh, pregnancy, obesity, um, uh, and also um, uh, constipation. So Tisa, uh -huh. is that the same reason you would operate today or not operate? Yeah, um, well, I would only operate if patients were symptomatic. You, ha you have patients who have hiatal hernias that are asymptomatic. Um, and those that may not have symptoms of reflux will most likely, if they're large paraesophageal hernias, will most likely have other symptoms such as chest, pre you know, pressure in the chest, postprandial pain. Um, and in those cases, I would uh, intervene. Yeah, so I agree that the, if, if it's asymptomatic, you really don't have to operate, but most of these patients, you sit them down, you can talk to them and find a history and you'll find that most are actually probably symptomatic. Right, they just haven't realized that they, they found ways to compensate or cope and uh, it's become a part of their everyday life. So they don't think about it as much. So let uh, me ask you that too, please. Uh, Dr. Pryor, I was just wondering in your experience whether these symptoms are always GI because I think that we underestimate, especially in more of a uh, type three defect, the pulmonary symptoms that these patients have. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think those are actually pretty common, particularly larger defects that are occupying some of the space in the chest. Patients will have some shortness of breath, even shortness of breath with exertion, and that'll be what they come for. Or they'll have recurrent aspiration and actually have aspiration pneumonitis or, or you know, lung damage from that that's more chronic. So that, that's a real symptom of a larger hiatal hernia. I'm sure Tina's gonna get into this, but there are other patient factors that'll affect that decision-making process too. We've all seen the 99-year-old patient come in with a large hiatal hernia, but happily living her life, not having any dysphagia. And in many cases, that's gonna be the better part of valor not to try to improve a situation that's stable. Likewise, there are patients who are gonna show up with a 36.5 BMI and a seven centimeter hiatal hernia. And that's someone that if you can get them to lose 15, 20 pounds, statistically their odds of a lasting repair are gonna go up. So there are patients that even if they have significant hiatal hernias, their other uh, abdominal or their other uh, health conditions may well dictate that a more conservative approach or certain meeting certain goals to optimize or pre-optimize their status like stopping smoking would be in their benefit. Mm -hmm. So Eugene, I'm gonna argue that that BMI 37, I would actually do a gastric bypass and parasophageal hernia repair on, so. Sure, no, I, I hear you. And we have uh, our, our colleagues that do that as well. Unfortunately, as you know, there are a very strict criteria for red flags that show up in those patients. And right. uh, for our group, if you're late to two uh, uh, pre-op appointments, you get, you're off the list. They're not gonna deal with you because the odds that you'll have problems post-op or uh, post-op compliance issues go way up. So 
for those patients where they've been rejected by or insurance doesn't cover, um, we have to give them some game plan for uh, for what they're if they are symptomatic, especially. But specifically for someone asymptomatic with a higher than 35 BMI who is not a candidate for gastric bypass, whether psychologically or medically, uh, or because they don't want to undergo that operation themselves, that's another indication where I might not even offer surgery for them. Right. So in the interest of time, we need to keep moving, but I just wanted to make sure you saw in the chat, Dr. Suzaki, Dr. Welsh, who's uh, here representing our rural surgical group, even though he's so well connected with everything, uh, asked if Dr. Google out there, um, if the patient is found to have a hiatal hernia, do they tend to find symptoms that they found using Dr. Google? What are your thoughts, Dr. Suzaki? Um... I don't know. Uh, I guess because every patient we've seen come in uh, or who has been referred to us has been referred to us because they are symptomatic. However, because Dr. Google does exist, I wouldn't be surprised if someone had an incidental finding um, because they were imaged for some other reason and they managed to, um, you know, take an incident where, oh, you know, I did have that one episode. And, and so, you know, they're convinced they're symptomatic, even though they may not be. Yeah, I find a lot of our foregut patients, and we were talking about this actually in clinic today um, with my fellow, um, have some of the supertentorial issues that lead them to perseverate on symptoms or find them. Yeah, there's a subset of patients in every disease category who will show up not only having researched Dr. Google, but will also have a tape recorder out and they'll have cell phones set up with, uh, with friends or family that are listening in on you with your permission, of course, and sometimes even without. Um, and you just have to stick to your guns and know that you are in this situation um, the best source of truth for this subject matter. You've done your research, you have the experience, and you just give them the stats and give them their um, their options as best you understand them, best as possible, and go from there. All right, Tina, lead on. Okay. Um, so you know, up until this point, the the symptoms were felt to be due to pinching off the stomach at the hiatus. So not that you know the junction is above or that. Uh, uh, the cardiophrenic angle is no longer existent, but because there's pinching of the stomach. So all the interventions up until this point focused on correcting this anatomic defect, you know, getting the stomach back down and just closing the hiatus. Uh, but the problem was that most patients still had persistent symptoms. Um, so now you have, these are doctors Allison and, and Dr. Barrett, and they kind of went shifted from an anatomical mechanical condition and shifted the focus over to functional physiologic based. Um, and, you know, said that the reflux esophagitis and its complications are physiologic consequences of these anatomic um, abnormalities. So um, Allison in the mid 50s, um, you know, attributed reflux esophagitis due to incompetence at the GE junction um, and that this was, uh, the cause of this was a sliding hernia. So his um, approach was focused on the crural sling. It was a transthoracic approach, so you would reduce the hernia um, and uh, rendition of the cardio by suturing the phrenoesophageal ligament and the peritoneum to the abdominal diaphragm, and then do a posterior crural approximation. He classified these into two categories, sliding and parasophageals. Um, he supported surgical treatment because the symptoms were distressing enough to patients, um, and that you know this continued superficial inflammation of the esophagus um, is liable to be complicated by um, uh, ulceration or fibrosis. So what he did actually is 22 years later, um, he went back and reviewed 421 of his own cases that he had done and found that there was a recurrence of hernia or reflux in almost half of his patients and actually reported it at the American Surgical Association meeting in, in the early 70s, which you know was viewed as you know being pretty courageous uh, just to go back and say half of these patients didn't benefit from what I did. Um, which is always hard to say. <laughs> um, so Dr. Barrett, however, he believed that there was a fold of mucosa at the GE junction that served as a flap. And so his focus was restoring this cardioesophageal angle. Um, he reported that there's columnar line esophagus and ulcerative complica um, complications. And now, you know, we have the term Barrett's esophagus. Um, he also emphasized the frequency of a sliding hernia, but also noted the occurrence of a parasophageal hernia. Um, and I cannot read all of this because some of the quote is behind some pictures, um, but um, 
his rationale was to say that, you know, the hernia should be reduced because the presence of it um, allows for the reflux to occur and we should restore this angle um, by fixing the cardia below the diaphragm and allowing the fundus to balloon up under the dome. So prior to Allison and Barrett, um, in the early th or mid thirties, uh, Dr. Nissen, um, performed the procedure that was a precursor to the Nissen fundoplication. So he was actually the son of a Prussian physician um, and actually started off treating TB patients and was the first Western surgeon to do a pneumonectomy in a, in a TB patient. Um, in 1933, he actually fled Berlin uh, when Hitler instituted the Jewish boycott. So he fled to Istanbul where he became chief of surgery there. At that point in time, he had a, uh, 28 year old patient um, who had ulceration of the distal esophagus that actually eroded into the pericardium. So he did an esophagectomy, he reimplanted the esophagus into the stomach and um, used a Witzel technique to sort of protect that anastomosis to prevent leakage of the anastomosis. Um, what he found postoperatively is that the patient who conveniently had reflux symptoms now had no longer had these symptoms. Now, in, the, in 1946, he was in New York, he was at Maimonides, and he was consulted on uh, Dr. Bucky, who apparently was a famous American uh, radiologist, because he had a long history of an incarcerated parasophageal hernia. He determined that he was too frail for the thoracotomy. So for the first time, he did a laparotomy. He did the reduction, and he did an anterior gastrectomy, and you know, maintain relationship with Dr. Bucky, and he did remain symptom free for 15 years. Gastropexy, not gastro gastrectomy. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, gastropexy. Um, so in the mid 50s, at that point, he had crossed back over to Europe, and he was in Basel, and uh, he did what he called a gastroplication. So there was a 49 year old female with three years history of reflux esophagitis, but she did not have a hiatal hernia. So he divided the frontoesophageal ligament, mobilized the esophagus, and he passed the fun, uh, fundus behind the stomach and did a fundoplication, wrapping both the anterior and posterior walls of the stomach around the lower six centimeters with four to five interrupted sutures, at least one of them incorporating the anterior wall of the esophagus over a stent. Um, he had an excellent outcome and the, um, it was reproducible. Um, so, that was the first iteration of a Nissen fundoplication, if you will. He performed that operation because he actually recalled the fact that his patient in Istanbul had suffered relief from reflux symptoms. Um, and so in 1956, manometry was used, lower esophageal uh, sphincter was identified. In 57, collis gastroplasty uh, was developed. Um, Lucius Hill studied physiology and anatomy and he used pH sensing to confirm the diagnosis of reflux preoperatively and confirm success postoperatively um, and determined that the cardiophrenic angle was essential. So he restored the angle of his by reapproximating the frenoesophageal bundle and anchoring them to the median arcuate ligament. In 67, he published his eight year experience with this posterior gastropexy. Initially, he had a high incident of postoperative dysphagia. So what he started doing was using manometry intraoperatively so that he could tailor his suturing to achieve lower esophageal pressures um, that were ideal. So here you have a picture of Mario Rossetti um, with Dr. Nissen. Um, apparently he was his favorite student. Um, and they modified the, the Nissen and used only the anterior wall. And so what he would do is he would insert his finger posterior to the esophagus to help slide the, um, the, uh, the fundus over um, and uh, bring it up through the opening in the um, uh, part of the opening that he created by uh, taking down the um, pars lucida. The only problem is that dysphagia was very common among these post and fundoplications and that's how the partial wrap developed. Um, the door and dupe actually uh, came about in Europe. Um, so, and, and people did have less symptoms of dysphagia uh, with the partial wraps. 
So you had Donahue, Demuster, and Johnson uh, who continued to work with the Nissen and modified it further by, you know, taking down the short gastrics and creating a much looser wrap. Um, and Demuster and Johnson took it one step further and just found out that the optimal length is about two centimeters, which is about which is a third of what Dr. Nissen had originally described. Um, by creating a shorter wrap, um, they were able to reduce the post-op bloating and dysphagia. So this is just a nice picture of the types of uh, hiatal hernias we have. I'm not going to go to it in depth because I'm assuming everyone is very familiar and understands the difference between type one through four. Um, I like this because it gives you radiographic and endoscopic examples of what the various hernias look like. Um, with the type two parasophageal um, on endoscopy, you can see that there is a hernia at about the level of where the GE or about where the GE junction is, so that it is parasophageal. Uh, for the type three, you do see that there is a parasophageal, but that the GE junction is higher than the level of the diaphragm, which is marked out in arrows. Um, I just wanted to take just one minute over here and just ask Dr. Pryor again, you know, radiologists get all crazy about this because sometimes they'll come up with this, that, and the other. And I, Rory, I don't know what your thoughts are, but what I usually say is where is the GE junction and is there stomach above or below it? That's all I want to know. What, what, what do you ask of your radiologist? I mean, the two things that I think are really relevant is, is there stomach up in the chest? And then what's your esophageal length? And, and honestly, the type of hernia beyond that doesn't matter as much. So even a type four with a lot of stuff up there, if the diaphragmatic defect's not that big, it's not that hard to repair and you get in there laparoscopically and a lot of that stuff's gonna fall out before you even really have to do much with your procedure. So the differentiation in the preoperative planning comes in as your esophagus gonna to be too short and then how big is the actual diaphragmatic defect? I think that's more relevant. Ooh, she's One bringing up a short esophagus. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> she, she brought the call up already, but one thing I've noticed is that these imaging studies don't give you an idea of what periesophageal components or structures are up in the hiatus as well. And it's a pretty common finding, especially in larger patients, that there's a lot of fat, intra-abdominal fat, either attached to the stomach or independent of the stomach that is jammed up in there and it's likely causing some of the esophageal outlet um, symptoms that the patients are actually complaining of. So repairing these, which are really type four hernias in a way, because they're not, they're not the stomach at all. They're something extrinsic, the same as having the colon stuffed up in there, the pancreas, which we've also seen in these kind of situations. Interestingly, yeah, I think the, you can uh, miss that on your imaging a lot if you're getting it, particularly a barium swallow, um, yeah. you just won't see it. Totally. Um, and interesting, Tina mentioned the uh, the Demister modification on the on the Nissen wrap. Not only was it shorter, but it was a single U stitch with pledges, and it faced the right shoulder. So it was a lot of modifications that he did to the to the original um, the original description. And then Dr. Hill, who is a Seattle guy uh, up at um, Virginia Mason, I believe he was, mm -hmm. has a small but devoted uh, following of surgeons that still do the operation. I believe there's four still in practice in the country now. Uh, one of which, one of whom is Ralph A. So it's been part of, our, part of our group right here. So. Well, let me throw out the hill is I've actually started using that at the time of sleeve gastrectomy because we talk about reflux and sleeves. So some of these operations, and this is why the history is actually important, may come back into relevance depending on how we modify things. So a hill at the time of sleeve, I think makes a ton of sense. Yeah, do you do actually do uh, the actual <laughs> description involves a capturing a bite of aorta exodicia as well as the median arcuate ligament? So yeah, so I actually do a modified hill and I just sew <laughs> it to my curl closure, which I think actually is adequate. It just maintains that intra-abdominal esophageal length. But yeah, I, I'm not dissecting down um, that far. <laughs> Let's keep going in the interest of time. Okay, so. Um, Hiatal hernias, um, as we discussed, not all hiatal hernias or parasophageals are symptomatic and not all patients with reflux have hiatal hernias. So some of the common symptoms and complaints, heartburn, foul taste in the mouth, you know, people who need to sleep upright, they stop taking PO, you know, hours before they go to bed, dysphagia, people with shortness of breath, especially those who have um, larger parasophageal hernias, including the chest pain and pressure. Um, inability to tolerate PO, uh, regurgitation and vomiting, um, coughing, wheezing, hoarseness, aspiration, um, and a globus sensation. 
And there are complications of reflux and hiatal hernias, um, iron deficiency anemia for patients who are on PPIs, cammon ulcers, Barrett's esophagus, strictures, cancer, obstruction, and volvulus. Um, and so what I did want to ask the fellows is what is currently involved um, in their workup of patients who come and see them uh, in terms of you know, evaluating them for surgical intervention. And I can't see my chat box and I can't, I don't know how to bring it up without getting out of my screen, sorry. Yeah, so why don't we just ask uh, uh, Avi Noam, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Hi, can you hear me? We can, Tina, do you wanna repeat the question? Yeah, so if when you see a patient who's referred to you for a hiatal hernia or reflux, you know, what are, um, uh, what do you do in terms of working them up? Do you get studies? Do you refer them elsewhere for other uh, procedures? So, I mean, uh, first of all, it all depends on the context. Right. So, uh, I mean, sometimes we see these patients as part of, a, of our bariatric service. Sometimes we see, we see them as primary. Sometimes we see, we see them as redos, actually. Okay. So, 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 so I think the so, question is, so, James. So, so then, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, no. So, so what are the studies would, do you get at your practice when you're seeing somebody for a hiatal hernia? Is that question so, to me? Uh, no, uh, Avi. So, I mean, I, I, I think the the basic ones are the are the swallow and the manometry. Uh, I, if if there's a suspicion for a type four, of course we'll, we'll have a, a CT scan, and, and if it's a redo, then 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 definitely it, it, then it, it has to be a CT scan at all times. Um, other other than that, uh, the 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 other on, on top of that, it's also it's also always a, an EGD as, an, as part of the assessment, but that but usually we do that, but then it's not outside. Okay. Um, Rory, in the interest of time, I do want to make sure we're halfway through our time over here. So just make sure that we get to the appropriate portions that you want to really take deeper. Oh, yeah. So, um, Tina, if you want to move yeah. a little efficiently, yeah. that would be great. So um, the evaluation workup, I think the key thing, you know, we rule out cardiac causes. We, um, in our practice, we make sure the patient that has an EGD within the past two years, um, especially to be able to rule out other potential causes. Uh, an example is we had a young gentleman who has a history of um, herpes and has a history of herpes esophagitis. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that he did not have an active um, uh, herpes esophagitis at the time. You can also get 24 hour pH and penis probe, esophageal manometry, upper GI. Um, but SAGES actually does not recommend getting routine esophageal manometry. Um, uh, and they recommend only getting investigations where you know, the, the results would actually change your clinical management. So we do not routinely get 24-hour um, pH impedance probe or esophageal manometry. Sometimes they come to us already having had them done, uh, especially if they're referred to us by a GI, uh, a, a GI physician. Um, I guess the only thing is, um, you know, with esophageal manometry, if their presentation is uh, not typical and um, the EGD findings um, don't really support a hiatal hernia. Um, you know, you wanna, for a manometry, you wanna make sure that they don't have something like achalasia or nutcracker esophagus or anything else where doing just a hiatal hernia repair and a fund application would not actually benefit that patient. In terms of gastric emptying study, there's not a whole lot of benefit for getting that um, initially, but there uh, is potentially some benefit on these revisions uh, just to rule out um, potential vagus nerve injury on the previous operation to make sure that there's not um, any delayed gastric emptying. Yeah, and I would tailor that based on their symptoms. So if they're yeah. reflux symptoms, work them up for reflux. If they're dysphagia, make sure you get your motility. Yeah. And so the primary indication for a manometry, again, you're looking for spastic esophageal disease that would dictate something additional need to be done, would be chest pain or dysph on dysphagia. Chest pain with swallowing or dysphagia, or adonophagia, sorry, is your cardinal sign for that. And then as far as gastric emptying, the, the main thing you're looking for there is a downstream obstruction that you create a closed loop by creating a, a wrap on top of the top of the stomach when they don't empty the bottom part of the stomach. But typically those patients will have pretty characteristic symptoms like Rory was, was mentioning, 
they'll have uh, intermittent vomiting, typically several days or weeks apart when they've accumulated all this stuff in their stomach and then they throw it back up again. And otherwise it can be asymptomatic between those times. But if you actually have a gastric outlet obstruction, whether physical or physiologic, that needs to be addressed before creating a obstruction from the outlet uh, north, uh, the top end of the stomach. And so uh, Dr. Cho had alluded to this before in terms of patient consideration consideration optimization, obesity being a big one. If their BMI is 35, uh, we do discuss gastric bypass with them. Um, some people are open to the referral. Um, and if they're not, they do come back for a follow-up visit several months down the line, um, you know, because they say that they'll try to lose weight. Um, age also something to take into consideration and comorbidities. Things have incre that increase intra-abdominal pressure, people are constipated who have COPD that's not well controlled and tobacco use is a big one for us. Um, and so if they are uh, smokers, everyday smokers, they have to either quit smoking or significantly cut back. Right. So- Yeah, okay, keep going. Okay, so procedural interventions. I'm actually just curious as to how many fellows have actually done Lynx or TIFF. Uh, if you are using Zoom, can you raise your hand? Fellows and recent grads, James. <laughs> Lynx or TIFF? Anyone? This is uh, Dan Barrera from uh, Advent Health. So actually, I did quite a bit of Lynx in, as a resident in Denver. Uh, I had an attending uh, mentor of mine who was very um, pro Lynx and pretty much offered them to everyone who who qualified for a, uh, for a Nissen fund application, he would offer Lynx alone. As, as long as they didn't have any um, like uh, metal allergies or needs for like uh, serial MRIs or things like that. And I think Bola said that he had done uh, Lynx to Dr. Welsh. Are you getting flashbacks of the angel chick device? Uh, <laughs> so, so comments. Yeah, for me, I don't think Lynx makes sense in the setting of the big parasophageal hernia. I do links in my practice. I do it for reflux disease, but um, not super great here. And TIFF, if you're already in there laparoscopically, I don't see the benefit. Okay, great. Let's keep moving just uh, so that we keep he hit, hitting some of these high points. I totally agree with you, Laurie. If you're doing the whole dissection, I don't know what the point of stopping at yeah. that point is. This would happen before uh, going to the OR. Um, I've never seen a links or TIFF done. Um, the European Society for Gastrological Endos Endoscopy actually uh, recommends against TIFF. Um, there was a study out of the Netherlands where they actually uh, did a bunch of measurements pre-TIFF and then followed them up at three months. And hiatal hernia reduction was only, only occurred about half of them. Um, esophagitis was cured in, in less than half. And a third of them required actually revisional lapar laparoscopic fundification. Uh, links. It's, you know, magnets that are used, obviously not for the large hiatal hernias or parasophageal hernias. There are a lot of contraindications to um, doing links. Um, BMI, you know, hernias that are greater, this is actually a typo on their part, um, greater than uh, three centimeters um, and others that were mentioned. So, you know, we get down to laparoscopic and I say laparoscopic nissen fund application because that's what we do here. We, um, we're not doing them robotically. There is a learning curve as is, with most laparoscopic procedures. Um, it's a pretty short learning curve in that there's only 25 to 30 cases. And with those um, initial cases, there's higher risk of intraoperative complications. Um, but the quality of life score and objective functional outcomes are similar between um, the early phase and the late phase of the learning curve. So, you know, risks and complications, um, I think they're pretty obvious. The complication rate is 13%, which I thought was pretty high. But if you're talking about splenic injury, it's not uncommon for us to see, you know, infarct of the superior pole of the spleen as we've taken down the short gastrics um, or, you know, getting a pneumothorax because we've actually violated the, um, the pleura. So for us, you know, patient selection, you know, BMI less than 35, ideally less than 30. We do have a discussion if they're between 30 and 35 of trying to lose weight because, um, their, you know, best chance of, uh, of a durable repair is the first one. Um, and that, you know, trying to minimize the risk factors and the, that being intra-abdominal pressure, smoking cessation we talked about. So things that are predictors of a good outcome are having an abnormal 24-hour pH probe, having typical symptoms, and having good response to medical therapy. 
Respiratory and atypical symptoms usually improve, but less so than the typical symptoms. The complications, gas bloat happen a fair number of these patients, but they typically resolve within a month. Dysphagia will happen. However, if it persists beyond six weeks and is more likely caused by hiatal closure, that's too tight, dumping, inability to vomit and recurrence. So in our patient, we had a 71 year old female who had a large parasophageal hernia with intermittent volvulus. She has a past medical history. Um, the significant one is inflammatory myositis and substance abuse. Um, she, is, she was on prednisone daily and she actually still is. Uh, when she tried to get off the prednisone, uh, it, her inflammatory myositis just flared. So this is um, her hiatal. Here we go, now I have a mouse. Oops. So this is um, a CT scan of her chest and where you see this large parasophageal hernia. Here's a sagittal view. And you see it's retrocardiac, a nice, nice large hernia. Um, okay, so in this CT scan was actually done in July of 2019, but because of all these episodes of myositis, she didn't um, have a GI consult till April. At that time, an urgent EGD was recommended. However, patient elected to postpone that for a month due to COVID. When that EGD did occur, um, uh, esophagitis was noted as well as gastric volvulus and she had a large parasophageal hernia. Um, she did have an upper GI done showing that large hiatal hernia, spontaneous reflux, um, the caliber of the esophagus was normal with normal swallowing and the gastric emptying was normal. So she came to see us after that, complaining of vomiting and regurgitation for several months, epigastric pain, worsening dysphagia, and only able to keep down liquids and a quarter of the solids she ate. Prior to um, being scheduled, she had numerous visits to the ED um, and a fracture of, of the left humerus um, associated due to myositis combined with her alcohol abuse. Um, so the day she was admitted for the humeral fracture, she stopped drinking um, and remained uh, drink free. Uh, she, we, she was scheduled for a laparoscopic parasophageal hernia with us um, using mesh on the third, um, and I'm going to kind of jump forward. A lot of people will start with a right-sided approach. We take a left-side approach first. We take down the short gastrics and take it all the way up to the hiatus, and then we divide the peritoneum along the, the hiatus, carrying that up. Um, and then once we've reached our max, we will take down the pars lucida, carry that up as well. Um, so here we're doing our dissection. It was a large hernia, which we actually reduced before we started recording. Um, actually, everything reduced very easily, um, but she did have a very large sac. Um, so we did spend a fair amount of time dissecting the sac free. And important thing being that, you know, you do, you do a circumferential dissection of the sac. Um, going to, you can see so that- Tina, Do you try to reduce the contents um, significantly before you do the sac dissection or is the sac dissection one of your earlier steps? We reduce a majority of the of the stomach um, and we've been able to reduce most of it all um, in most of the cases. Um, I find in my practice I actually don't focus on that. Anything that comes down easy, great. And I don't chase adhesions. I don't do anything else. I get your sack down and find that that's actually the easiest way to reduce everything. Yeah, I wish uh, Tina had shown that particular clip, but uh, the key pearl in that is identifying the pleural sac junction on the right crust. If you get in that plane, then it's magic. You just go back there in that sort of packing crate, filmy um, avascular stuff, and then everything comes right out. So when Tina refers to reducing the hernia, she's talking about basically the visceral reduction of the stomach yeah. to make sure that that right. is all, you can pass an AG tube if you need to, et cetera, but it'll go right back up in there until you get the sac out. Right. And once you get circumventional sac definition, once the sac is out, the hernia is reduced. So, so yeah, and she, she knows that. That's, that's what we do. Yeah. Um, so there was a large sac. We spent a fair amount of time actually uh, dissecting the sac out and actually removing the sac. Um, so, you know, things to reduce uh, recurrence, complete excision of the hernia sac, making sure that you've got good esophageal mobilization, the chiroplasty fundoplication. Mesh will prevent early recurrence, but there's no um, evidence for long-term uh, reduction of long-term recurrence and decreasing in intra-abdominal pressure. So I just wanted to talk about mesh a little bit, prosthetic versus biologic. Um, prosthetic significantly reduced rate of recurrence, but there are 
not insignificant complications associated with it. Biologic mesh is more expensive. Um, and the study um, from Pellegrini's group showed that there was a lower recurrence rate at six months, but no, uh, no difference at five years. Um, the, I think the key with that was that radiologic recurrence did not always correlate with recurrence of symptoms. Um, so even if they do recur, a majority of these patients remain symptom free. There's a higher recurrence rate for large hernias. Um, and uh, I thought this was interesting. There's uh, out of Reno, they were using urinary bladder matrix. Um, their recurrence rate was 3.7 versus 1 point or versus 16% at uh, three years. The alternative is a falciform ligament buttress, which I've never actually seen, um, but I know that Dr. Pryor does do this. Um, and this was um, uh, reported uh, from GW, where they did 104 patients, um, had an upper GI 12 months post-surgery, and only five out of 57 patients that had a recurrence, um, and only three of them required operative intervention. So has um, anybody else on the call done this? It's a really nice, super easy technique. You just take the falciform off the anterior abdominal wall and then just take it down to where it interfaces with the liver. And then you can kind of swing it under the left lobe and it, it sits really nicely. So when I've had to do relaxing incisions or other cases where I would use mesh, which I don't do routinely, I think it's super nice because it can cover your mesh and really protect it. Um, you can also use it if you just get a little bit of tearing in your muscle as a... Uh, tissue reinforcement so and you can fill it. for an intra-abdominal flap. <laughs> <laughs> so we use it actually to wrap up pancreatic anastomoses with whipples. There's actually some data coming out that that decreases your risk of GDA blowouts, believe it or not. So we, we use that routinely. But as you know, uh, Tina, I don't know if you found this, but we published using a uh, keyhole mesh uh, with alloderm actually, and our recurrence rate was very low at one year. Again, we don't have long-term follow-up on those patients, but it appears to be quite low. And as you said, radiologic doesn't equal uh, physiologic uh, recurrence. So I thought this was an interesting paper out of uh, Southern Florida. Um, it was changing the perspective and uh, viewing it, is it as, is it truly a recurrence versus progression of the disease? Um, and what they did was they, reviewed um, patients who were deemed to have recurrence and actually uh, looked at where the recurrence was located. And, and based on their finding, they are saying that, you know, if this, the recurrence is posterior, then it's truly a recurrence and it's due to suture failure. And that occurred sooner. Um, if it was circumferential, then it was a combination of the two. And if the defect was anterior to the esophagus, then they weren't, they said that that's not actually a recurrence, but more disease progression. Um, and I just thought this was very interesting because it changes your perspective on things. Um, so, um, yeah, you know. so this has made me modify my technique a little bit that sometimes you can find that really attenuated tissue anteriorly when you're doing one of these defects. So I've actually started putting a stitch or two to actually get some more substantial tissue together anteriorly just because of this data. Does anybody else do that or have they changed because of that? Yeah, I have. I, have. I do often with large hiatal hernia, I do, I use posterior and anterior, both of them. I blame if it's a, large, John Hunter. If it's a very large hernia. I blame John Hunter for my not doing it because we were on a panel together at a Oregon, um, Washington uh, chapter meeting for the college and he mentioned that he doesn't believe in anterior closure. So uh, what I will do is there's a, a paper, I think out of um, Madigan, but it was presented at the North Pacific uh, almost what, five, six years ago, describing the shapes of the hiatus and a D-shape versus a O-shape versus a V-shape versus um, uh, almost a uh, keyhole shape. And that that correlates strongly with the recurrence rates and the worst one being the D-shape. So when, when you have that one, there's room laterally to place stitches to try to reduce the pressure on that. And that's the situation where I, like uh, Rory alluded to, we'll do a relaxing incision to, to reshape that D shape into a more of an O shape or a V shape and reduce some of the tension on there. Um, I prefer by far the right uh, release, but you can do a left release as well. Unfortunately, I've had that herniate with, um, with, a, uh, with, a, with the stomach going uh, against all odds, flipping entirely up and the distal stomach getting incarcerated into the relaxing incision that required a, um, 
laparoscopic repair. Fortunately, it was a pretty simple repair, but obviously underwent a separate operation for no good reason eight months later. So Eugene, how do you make that relaxing incision? How do you decide? Um, if I'm having to, if I'm worried about sutures pulling through and I'm seeing pulling through happening at the time of suturing, that's where I'll offer my first double pledges. And the pledge I use, because I use a, uh, there's an absorbable mesh we use called a bio A, which is essentially a vicral patch or vicral sponge. Um, there's virtually no downside to putting that other than cost. We'll use, we'll make pledges out of that and then reinforce it rather than putting a foreign body or a big wad of cotton in there. And if I'm noticing that the, the, the there's bleeding or there's uh, muscle separation going on, that's all I'll entertain a release of first aperitoneum only. I'll do a partial. And if I need to, that I can, you can go entirely through into the chest cavity without really any negative effects as long as you don't bind with the pleura. Uh, and then if you need to patch that, you can. But if you do that on the liver side with the liver protected, you don't necessarily even need to cover that. It's the, it's the left side of coral relax incision. You have to cover that. That's, that's what results in a, uh, in a post-op complication. So Rory, I'm just going to jump in and ask. So I, I believe that if you do enough transmediastinal dissection, you can always close posteriorly, but I'd like to hear what others think. James, I guess you're a little biased. You trained with me. So but what are your thoughts after? Yeah, of course, I'm a little biased training with you and using the robot as well. Um, and, you know, I think the definition of short esophagus is still kind of an elusive thing. I don't know that there's a lot of liter literature with very strict criteria of when to do some of these maneuvers. Um, I'm on the Sages Forgut Committee actually, and we're working on a white paper now. We're in the kind of big, big literature gathering process to decide um, for patients with anywhere from type two to type four with diagnosis of short esophagus, you know, should we be doing lengthening procedure or not? Or when do we do it? Or how do we do it? Um, I know Demeester has spoken at length about this and, and published a bit, but, uh, you know, I, I have not yet had to do a, a colis or, or anything like that for a short esophagus, but, um, you know, not to say that I would never do it. I mean, I'm certainly um, learning about all of these techniques because I'm sure I will need them at some point. To this point, I haven't, haven't actually. So as to that collis topic, we were just gonna try to do a SAGE's guideline on that and there's no adequate data. There's just none, which is why we actually asked the Forgut Committee to do this background research for us. And if you guys are SAGE's members and you do enough parasophageal hernias, we're actually gonna try to do a giant study because nobody does enough short esophagus cases that they can do this at any one institution um, where we're going to try to pool our stuff using video to screen people to make sure people are doing a good job but um, really try to answer does Collis make sense. I think it'll be great. Rohan, to address your question, um, I agree we can almost always get a posterior closure in a native case. The problem that strikes fear is when you have a redo case especially where somebody else put some other kind of biologic material in there and now you've got an O-shaped recurrent defect and it is just fibrous and, and, uh, and it doesn't have any flexibility to the, to the, to the uh, curl uh, columns. That's when getting this together is gonna to be uh, problematic and you know that's when you see that. Kevin, you, you, you had a comment, Kevin Reeves? Uh, just because I <laughs> unmuted. Um, yeah, no, I was just gonna, <laughs> you mentioned Steve earlier. So, you know, my experience prior to Demister joining our group, I. I think I did like one or two colluses in the first five years of my practice. And the default, <clears throat> I think now is, um, I use collis extremely commonly, as does Steve. Actually, our whole practice, we use them much, much more commonly. It's probably 25, 30% of our cases. Um, and part of that was Steve was looking at his initial data with us and his, his recurrence rate initially. And it's kind of fleshed out a little bit. We have to see what it is now, but seem to have a lower recurrence rate. But if I was noticing also on garden variety Nissens, although they're few and far between in our practice, um, you know, the natural intra-abdominal esophageal length on someone who, who truly just needs a Nissen they, or a fund application they don't need a hernia repair, it's long. I mean, the esophagus is way, it's, it's more than three, four centimeters of intra-abdominal esophageal length. And I think I was cheating myself earlier in my career when, you know, with some traction, I could convince myself I had two and a half, three centimeters. And like a naturally long, you know, appropriately length esophagus is, is really long. And, um, and so then when we started making the decision to do a colis, then we at rest had this three to four centimeter esophagus. And all of a sudden it was a, you could kind of feel the internal relief. And when we would go back and do endoscopies at three months, the fund you know, looked nice and 
Um, you know, again, all this data is still preliminary in terms of our recurrence rates, but I think there's definitely a role um, for that. And this is, you know, releasing, uh, you know, primary vague or anterior vagus like Brent and um, <clears throat> Carlos uh, Pellegrini described up at you know, UW years ago in terms of the technique and such as well. Um, what I don't do a lot of, and Steve and uh, Christy do more of, and I think Daniel, my other partner, does more of, are um, left relaxing incisions um, and way out. So they're out about two you know, centimeters or so off the, off the ribs um, with a decent sized Gore-Tex patch to really reduce the amount of tension on that left cruise. Um, I found it to reduce the tension sometimes, but um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, kind of a Brian Louis style, um, sorry, a Brian Louis style pleurotomy on the left side and the whole the whole left diaphragm shifts over and comes together real real nicely or just dropping the pressure. I think I mentioned this in a previous web um, webinar uh, to like eight or 10 oftentimes it comes together and and then you realize that's really physiology. You know, patients aren't walking around with a capno peritoneum of 15. You know, they're, they're more, you know, rates of like, you know, eight millimeters of mercury, hopefully. But um, that's been kind of our experience. And um, it's been a paradigm shift in my practice from almost no callus to you know, much, much higher rate. And um, we'll see, um, you know, that may change again in the next couple of years, but it seems to be working for now. So Kevin, what do you do for your post-op management of a patient who's had a colis? Cause it's different. Cause now you have on what looks like the esophagus actually gastric tissue. Yeah, so um, they all get endoscopies at three months. And so, you know, really we're just looking there for, you know, asymptomatic esophagitis. And, and uh, um, if obviously if we see you go ahead and put them on an acid medication for the year. And then at one year, everybody's getting, um, you know, upper GI with tablet, pH motility. If they've already had an endoscopy because they're a colis patient three months, we spare them at one year. Um, and then all the other parasophageals with, um, with alcoholuses get, uh, you know, barium, um, swallow a tablet, um, pH motility, and a, and a scope at, at a year. Um, so that's, that's our difference. Higher level. In, in the interest of time, uh, yeah. we've got five minutes, and I want to make sure that you make the points that you wanted to make with regard to what we should, especially for the fellows. Okay. All right. So, Tina, did you want to finish up? Uh, this is just uh, you know showing a the the anterior and b the circumferential. Um, it was just a video oh, forward, video footage um, because like, like Dr. Cho said, we do use mesh, we use bio a, um, and it is horseshoe shaped. But then we also cut a notch out um, for the posterior aspect, um, and we do secure it with a yoke stitch and um, on either side, securing the fundoplasty uh, to the cura through the mesh. Um, so on post-operative course, this patient was having um, no difficulties with swallowing. Her only complaint was having some loose stools. Follow-up after that, everything had resolved um, and she had done well. So I think basically in conclusion, patient selection is very key. Um, setting realistic expectations of counseling patients, um, optimizing them, um, and you know, taking into consideration their individual risk factors in terms of choosing intervention. Um, and you know, obviously the goal is always to minimize risk recurrence and we don't have uh, you know, data showing that mesh use does help reduce it in the long term, but we do use it in the short term. Yeah, so great, great presentation and thank you really for that um, stimulating um, presentation for the discussion. The other thing that I think didn't get mentioned that I'd like to talk about, it was briefly in the chat, was the endo flip, which I've started using in my practice and I think has really been helpful because you can tailor things. You can make sure your diaphragmatic closure is not too tight. You can actually make sure your wrap looks good. Who else has used that and wants to comment? Dr. Benzie. Hey, sorry. Um, we actually just used it, actually just got out of the OR, um, and it definitely does guide and does change your management as well. Um, and definitely in terms of whether to wrap or not wrap after a redo, 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 or a takedown, um, it's very easy to use once you get past like the first learning curve. Um, and it really gives you real-time advice um, more so than a bougie. It also can help you determine if you do have that spasticity because the esophagus will react to the balloon being in inflated and deflated. So um, if you have a more um, spastic esophagus, it kind of puts you on the side of, you know, a looser wrap or not wrapping at all. And does anybody routinely PEXI or G-tube? 
Uh, so we have been routinely pexing. I used to do a G-tube routinely at Rory. Um, I, I didn't find it to be a great pexy actually, uh, because you can still slip up along the G-tube, but more of a pexy to the left diaphragm seems to work better for us. And honestly, we don't routinely uh, wrap these patients with a true type three defect. Uh, we'll just see what the end of flip shows. Yeah, that's interesting. I do a, a pexy of the wrap to the diaphragmatic closure because the most common recurrence is going to be your wrap sliding up into your chest. Um, so that makes sense to me. So, Others? Dr. Welsh? Well, I, I wondered if I could ask Dr. Cho a, a question. He mentioned something earlier about uh, troubles on a redo, depending on what somebody else left behind. And yeah. I guess if you could snap your fingers and get one word out to folks doing uh, doing wraps and Nissens, uh, maybe, I don't know, rural surgeons, what would you not like to see show up when you have to do the redo? A metal or plastic mesh okay. <laughs> embedded on the back of there. That can need a softgectomy if it's really uh, if it's really embedded. And that's not a situation to be in. In fact, I think the consensus that Dan Smith put out when he was Sages president was you find that situation back out and try to go back six to 10 months later. Don't even try to get a mesh uh, disincorporated or a plastic or metal mesh disincorporated. So I don't think anyone I know is putting in prosthetics in contact with the esophagus. The setting now is to make a relaxing decision and to use the prosthetic there to close the, uh, like like uh, Dr. Wells said about, or sorry, what Dr. Sorry, the other speaker said about closing a left relaxing seizure with a Gore-Tex patch. That's, that's a situation where I would want to see that. But otherwise, yeah, I would not want a permanent structure in contact with the esophagus. And that's a nightmare if I see that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, in line with that, one other take home message is if you're a rural surgeon, you don't do a lot of hiatal surgery, you do not need to do the formal repair in the emergent setting. I think a gastropexy is completely appropriate. And actually some of those patients will never need another surgery. So a gastropexy alone, not touching the diaphragm is the perfect acute care surgeon option. Rory, how about uh, the, the Olschläger thing where he's, he's talked about in an acute, care, an acute situation, patients even unstable, uh, just uh, tubularize in the stomach, just do essentially a sleeve and get out to just prevent the volvulus and the, and the gastroenterocystis. I, so I, on those people, I'll just do the pexy. I won't do a sleeve. I think that's all you need. Okay. Great. Can I tell you I something, mean, Aurora? Yes. Aurora, <coughs> I think the, one of the key points what you mentioned before, I think after the wrap, you should fix posteriorly. You were asking, you were talking about the arcuate ligament, you know, so the pre-aortic fascia is the best way to fix it there. The posterior wrap, and there is some papers that they have proven that lot of difference, you know, for recurrence, yeah. except you, especially the work of Cadieri in Belgium. So I think it's a must to fix it posteriorly the most of the time. Well, really great discussion. Rohan, do you want to finish this off? Yeah, I just want to say one thing which is politically charged, but I am going to say that you're just hearing how much new, how many nuances there are to this topic. And, and I really do think, and thank you, Rory, for pushing this. I do think that this concept of foregut disease and really a focus on this area that you really brought to the forefront is so critical because it's not easy even to do a straight Nissen, I don't think. It's really easy to screw somebody up. And for those of us in this group that are doing redos a lot, uh, you know, that can change somebody, right? If they've had both Nissen's bagged, you know, all of a sudden, you know, reflux doesn't seem like such a bad thing compared to dysphagia plus gas bloat plus regurgitation, right? And so, you know, first of all, kudos to all the program directors for teaching their fellows how to do this in a sophisticated way. Kudos to the fellows for realizing that they needed additional training uh, to get to this point, because the problem is you don't know what you don't know until you actually figure it out, right? And so for me, you know, like listening to Dr. Pryor, it's like, that's what I need to know. And so thank you for everyone for taking the time. And Rory, thank you for educating us. Dr. Suzaki, thank you for, you know, bringing us uh, to the forefront over here and for everyone for joining. I know it seems like a small group, but I really think this was very vibrant and I learned a lot and we'll be posting this on our website. So the others should be able to log in and, and, and watch it at another time. Any yeah. long comments? Oh, Alex, Alex Rosemogi joined us. Hey, Alex. Uh, uh, it's an interesting discussion. The only point, what I'd like to say was a lot of this got ironed out in the 50s. And we're revisiting the, the 
data about that was generated by Belzy and Ellis and all those guys. And, and so I, um, I, I, I really urge caution. I see these uh, trials where they're doing gastropexies, but that's not like what Aurora was talking about where she pexes the, the, the anterior fundus uh, to the left crust. They're talking about doing gastropexies in lieu of gastrostomy tubes. That, that's been done. That's like operating on somebody taking out the gallstones and closing the gallbladder. That's been done too. Uh, so there's no sense of reinventing the wheel. So uh, I temper your enthusiasm for uh, what we are reinventing. Like everybody here on this conference has said to somebody, in the middle of the night, if you come up with a new operation, don't do it. <laughs> I love it. Alex and I trained at the home of the Bell Z Mark IV through the left chest. So, so we're a little bit, <laughs> we're a little bit crazy. But thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Please remember um, our next uh, Grand Rounds is coming up next month, which is going to be June 28th, and it's going to be ERAS for pancreatic surgery. It's from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Dr. Nevla, you'll be talking about this, and uh, Dr. Uh, Rose. And Dr. Tim Pollack is going to be our moderator for that talk. So please do remind all of your fellows and faculty to join, please. And uh, thank you, LK, for putting this together. We will see you in a month and stay safe.